every day on the set and every day in post, every day in pre, I knew why these films they get made very much down here. I mean, I love the constraints because it forces us to be very creative, you know, and do some really interesting things that at first you don't want to do, things you don't, you're resistant. I wish we had this or we could do that. Well, you got this, so you either do two things, you either just s settle with mediocrity or you find a way to make it special. It's a very personal story uh, in many ways and then the bigger theme of the film, you know, became much more of a global sort of statement. And for Brian and myself, I think he and I at that point both felt like we, you know, uh, in our lives, we both felt like we were, we were sort of working really hard to get somewhere, but we had to take some kind of ultimate jump into something quite scary uh, to, to get back on, which was actually making this film, the idea of sort of turning our backs on what we'd been doing in Hollywood and just going renegade and making an, uh, an indie film back down here in Australia. It was kind of the same journey Whit was on, trying to get out of that life that he was in, uh, join West Coast and just, and just jump into something quite terrifying. We needed a film to push the boundaries and to experiment and, to, and to, to allow us to go as far as we possibly could. I think at this point of our career, it's safe to say we understood our voice, our artistic voice, and what we wanted to do with it. The idea for the script was really born out of anarchy. What the hell is this? No, I've always been a big fan of Shane's and I uh, always thought this is a sci-fi elevated by the drama that he would uh, bring and bring out of the actors. So I thought it was always going to be something uh, unique and, and uh, it's not just a conventional sci-fi thriller. I wouldn't say that any part of Infinity has been a walk in the park. It's been a struggle since the idea. The other thing for me was stress. You start to see the demons people could be harboring. That was another inspiration for me, you know, when these guys get infected, you know, how, how, do they, how do they handle it? What moral choices do they make to overcome the situation that they're in? You know, we weren't trying to fit into a, a traditional structure, we weren't trying to fit into a traditional way of doing it. So the inspiration was, was really, you know, a combination of where we're at in our lives, the type of film that we love being a dark sci-fi kind of uh, journey, and also just a, a character and a and an opportunity to kind of really do something special, you know, in a genre that I love. I mean, Shane, he had this concept of misdirection. So, so when we were writing, you, 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 you jump on this journey, like say with Sefton and Dave Ponter and Wit in the beginning of the story, and they're the characters that you're actually falling in love with. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Wit Carmichael's first day in the big leagues. The whole thing is taking false twists and turns the whole way, just to keep everybody on edge and, and, and you know, like you, you, you're anchored to Wit Carmichael throughout the whole story, but there, there are a lot of twists and turns that you don't expect. When we first showed Matt the script, and I, kind of, I was confident we could do the film, Brian was confident, but it's a mixture of confidence and excitement at, at the potential of doing it. So we were actually working towards doing a film called The Last Stand, and then the guy showed me the script of Infinity, and I was thinking, well, I'm really looking forward to doing the film we're about to do, but okay. Uh, and then I read the script for Infinity, and there was something different, something special about it. It was such a strong script, and I think in this day and age, when you're going to try to make a genre film, you need to do something extraordinary and, and something unique. I remember Matt really enjoyed the script, and Matt sort of came back and said, yeah, I think we can do it. I think I was so shocked that I was kind of like, I didn't actually expect people to say we could do it. Um, Realising that that was still part of the insanity of this whole team, Brett, Sid, everyone, was the fact that we kind of, we kind of knew it was nearly impossible, but for some dumb reason that excited us on this because nearly impossible, that nearly part was the reason we could do it. Everyone was invested emotionally and financially in the film. Crewing was always going to be difficult with three major Hollywood shows rolling into town at the same time. So here we were coming up with a new financial model, which some saw as a little risky. And we were competing against these full freight Hollywood behemoths. So we had to push ourselves further. We had to do something that was going to be exceptional. It's always going to be a challenge when you've got uh, not enough of a budget that the film would naturally demand. Um, so you're going to be multitasking, you're going to be overstretched, everybody's doing more than they should probably do under normal situations. But I, I'm used to that and I don't mind it. It kind of, you feel very integrated with the project, so it's, it's fine. That's just the nature of the beast. You know, it's very, very tight budget. I mean, it shouldn't have been able to be made on the budget, you know, as, as with the last one. Once something starts to work, it just attracts the right type of people. 
uh, and I think we were incredibly blessed to get the heads of departments that we got. You know, we've got some of the best people in the country. Every designer loves sci-fi because you're creating worlds. It's something uh, you don't do in a you know a regular film. You're creating everything basically, the whole world. Infinite is a classic example because all the sets are built sets. You know, so that we are creating that world from the ground up. George is really good at with the budget as well, trying to figure out a set design that was manageable, that looked great, that fit the, the style of the era, um, but that we could actually manage, you know, and I think it was the fact that a tunnel would become a control room, would become the end flight set, you know, completely redressed, but the, the structure, the basis of it uh, would, would remain intact. Because our budgets were really tight, I mean, tight, tight, tight. Um, and that's a hard thing for a sci-fi movie, considering we had about 21 sets to build. There has to be some really creative design thinking to figure a way around that. You know, with the team, the art department team, we came up with a, a kind of Lego set, really, because we built elements that could be recycled into other sets in, uh, in the film. So, you know, one set can be converted quite quickly. Again, we shoot, the shooting schedule is tight. It to turn things around really fast, and that's where the modular system of uh, the design was excellent because you could do an overnight change on a set and quickly uh, rejig it into something completely different. It kept a continuity of the look of the, the film and uh, that helped too, I think. I wanted to take a very familiar look. So, you know, Carl Robertson, the DAP and myself and, and production designer George, we sort of all got together and, you know, with the look of the film, we really wanted to, to go back to like that era of 79 to 82 which is Apocalypse Now, Alien, The Thing. Visually, we wanted to try and belong to that era, but uh, thematically and narratively go sort of somewhere completely different. The look of the film that Shane and I wanted was quite a classic 70s feel, kind of a retro look. One of those elements was a decision to shoot anamorphic, and we tested a whole bunch of Panavision anamorphic lenses and decided to go for the E-series and B and C series lenses, which were actually used in those films and that period. With using digital technology and shooting on the Alexa, it gave us a kind of a classic feel, but uh, with a modern spin on it. From day one, when we were in pre-production, there was such a great collaboration and we just fed off each other. You know, there's, there's this real connection with Carl that goes beyond the words. So for he and I, we both lived this together. There was a great trust between us and I think that carried through the film and it enabled us to work freely and to be able to have such a great uh, creative process. With the budget we had to try and find an existing structure that we could build upon uh, to make the film work. We went and looked at a really old boat that we could maybe shoot on. Uh, we went out to a sewage plant to try and find something there, but every one of the locations we found had its own set of challenges. We're looking at a location that was out in Cornell, which fit the mould for all the, all the sets and scenes that we needed, and we could do it all in one location, which is fantastic. We moved our carpentry units in, we moved everyone in, and we were starting to build the set around pre-existing things out at Cornell. We had builders building, painters painting, we were outlining where sets were going to stand. And we had air monitoring because we knew it was an old structure. We had air monitoring around the building to make sure that there was no asbestos because there was some asbestos in certain areas that was cordoned off. And not where we were working, but there was asbestos starting to creep in to the edges of the set. Uh, and once it's starting to creep in, it's, you don't know where it's going to go. The hardest moment in pre was probably having to tell everybody that we had a problem with our shooting location, which was going to be Cornell, to come in and say, guys, this is a high risk location. I don't think we should shoot there. You're the bad guy who's smashing everybody's dreams, basically, so close to the shoot. So when Jackie told us about the asbestos issue, you know, we had to stop. You know, it was a serious problem. So we had to make a really hard call four weeks out, I think four weeks out from, from shoot, to stop the location that was perfect for us, uh, what we thought was perfect for us, move all our teams out and we had nowhere to go. We have teams on payroll that have nothing to do because they've got nowhere to build. Uh, we've got nowhere to store our staff. Everything's in trucks. All of a sudden being able to use 20 or 25 sets that were in the script to having to build 20 or 25 sets in three weeks. <laughs> We basically gave ourselves a week to find a new location. And that was the only time on the film where I, I sort of really thought, this is not going to happen. This is not, we're not going to get there. 
Gladesville really was a saving grace. It not only provided two large studio spaces to rotate 21 sets over the eight weeks, but also had office space and areas for every department. We even had lodging in one of the studios. It really became the home of Infini. Maybe it wasn't perfect, it was going to have its own sound issues, but it was amazing under the circumstances and given the time pressure. It was a dream come true, really. It was terrible at the time when we were forced to find something else, but it's ended up being a miracle. And in that, a huge scene from the start went, which was uh, instead of the movie we see now, we sit on the monitors, we actually went with those guys on the jump to Infinity. We saw Ponta and uh, Wit in the first moment on Infinity, and the, these big explosions and coolant towers going off, and Ponta actually hunts Wit and then gets frozen. And that was originally in the film, and we had to chop all that out, and you had to watch it on the screens, and then we'd take, go to East Coast. So that was a shame to lose. I think that was that was that was a real shame, but that was a budgetary constraint of losing a week, you know, in, in pre-production. Casting, to me, should show what the real world is like. Imagining the future would be quite gentrified. Uh, we wanted to try and bring everyone together so that there was kind of a, a universal film to the cast. You couldn't really pick where the film was made or how the film was made because the, the cast gave nothing away because they came from everywhere. Wit, he's such a loyal man. He's a loyal character. He's conflicted, but his main focus is just to come home. For me, Wit Carmichael was kind of an essence of innocence and purity in a, in a sense in that he was a young guy who was in love with his wife and they wanted to start a family and, and, and they wanted a better life. They were in love, they were working for something better, they were striving for, for, for things that were good. He, he wanted to be a good husband and, and, a, and a good partner and a good man and a good father. So when Daniel McPherson's name first came up for the movie, uh, I was at first very hesitant because he's known in Australia kind of to date, he's been known as like the Ryan Seacrest of Australia. You know, he's, he's, he's a host, uh, good looking dude, uh, does a lot of celebrity stuff, uh, and he's done some, some, some reasonable TV work. But as far as where I wanted this to go and what I wanted the gravity of wit to be, I really just thought there's no way this guy, I've not seen anything in his work that makes me think that, that, that he could do that. Uh, I was invited to, to uh, audition for, for wit, um, but I was in the US, so I had to, to do it, uh, self-tape it and, and send it over. I emailed my manager and said, hey, is there any chance we can get in the room and just, I, I land on Friday and I leave Sydney on Saturday, is there any chance I could get in a room with, with Faith Martin, who was casting? So this is all happening while I'm flying to the airport on the, on the 11 o'clock flight back to Sydney and finally, just before we took off, they said, yeah, you can, you can audition with Shane and Faith. There was a lot of light to Dan, you know, and I, and I thought, no, I think he's got to go to such a dark place. I don't know if his life story is enough even to, to give him the, 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 the sub-basement that he kind of needs for this film. And I knew if he was finding himself in for this one moment, he had to think there was something inside of him that he really had to show me in person. And I think it was only about 10 or 15 minutes in and I just suddenly saw what, what this guy could do, where this guy could go. And I think that, and I knew that that was only the first part of it. Shane pretty much said, no, stop, 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 stop. Look, we're just, it's great. We'll just save it, we'll do it on the day. And Faith was like, you can't, you can't tell an actor that he's got the job in the room, you know. You know and Dan's commitment from then on, I was kind of never in doubt. Once I saw him in the room do it, I just knew that was the guy. I knew he was the guy that was going to take this journey and sort of represent the whole film across the board. And Shane was, was talking about the way he liked to work and think fully immersive and, and really pushing actors to, to go further and, and to go deeper and, and to really bring more to, to his films. And that was kind of music to my ears because I wanted to take the commitment that I've always had in my sport and the background that I started in and take that to, um, into, into my acting. Across the board with the casting from, you know, like Luke Hemsworth, you know, I, I really, I liked what, what he was all about, but I had to work with him to make sure the last name wasn't the thing. I wanted to make sure Luke as an actor stood on his own. What I hope would happen, I hoped uh, by casting Luke Ford and Dwayne Stevenson, that the two of those guys have a very, specific way of going about their work uh, and it's very much in line with how I like to work especially for this film and while I like every style I kind of wanted those guys to be my bulls my freight trains to come through every sort of moment and just do their thing and I knew that that would infect anyone else who who kind of had it was on the fence about or oh, should I commit should I go for it because I knew there'd be guys on the set no matter what who would be so down the rabbit hole that no matter what you thought you were going to do that the, the fucking hole was already wide and open for you to jump in
when I when I first met with Luke Ford for the for the film, I said to him, we had a lunch, and I said, I'm willing to do whatever it takes to get this right, and I know that you know what that means. And he said, and he actually said to me, he goes, if if we do this, and Chester Huntington and that story, if we really live it and really go for it, you're probably going to want to fire me halfway through. Like it's not going to be enjoyable for us, but by the time we get to the end, we'll have something that we're really proud of. But there's no there's nothing about this that we're going to enjoy in the typical sense of wow we're making a film how much fun is this so if you want to sign on for that Luke said to me I'm, I'm good to go and if you don't let's right now stay friends and just walk away from it. Shane is a very immersive director he's not one that steps on the set and just wants an actor or anyone really to just put on a character and then leave it there he always emphasizes in both production and in rehearsals, living with the character and becoming the character. The first thing was, let's not rehearse the script. Let's, let's rehearse memories. So that was part of the process designed into the film, was that we would get the script to a point where it made a lot of sense. But instead of trying to micromanage the script to, to potentially this or potentially that or whatnot, in the rehearsals, um, we had, when I got all the East Coast team together, for instance, I said, here's what the script says your relationships are but within the film that they can be something different. So why don't you guys just get together in character and have a night together? We rented out a penthouse in Sydney and we invited all the characters, all the cast, uh, over to Seat's house. And we had uh, lunch one day in character. Uh, we also did a hostage situation right here in the studio. We, we did all this so we can have this cohesiveness. Uh, when, we, when we approached the film, everyone was spot on with the character. Before cameras rolled, we, you know, had to do all these activities like laser tag. You know, we spent hours with each other, you know, under different uh, circumstances and scenarios. And we learned things together, we explored things together, we did silly things together. And so we were all so different um, as actors, personality-wise, and obviously in a team in Infinity, we we're all very different as well. It was good to get to know each other under a team environment I think the most helpful, helpful thing about the whole rehearsal workshop process was that we got to bond as, as a group. For the rehearsal process for me personally was creating a, a very strong background, which was never brought up in the film. I'm, we're in for that, there's the one scene. We had to bond just as, just as friends get to know each other. Shane sort of brought home to us how important that was. So we actually were changing a lot of the relationships in the film based on how or like people naturally felt towards one another. Not what the film told them they should feel, what they naturally felt. Having done so much, so much work on the character beforehand, the rehearsal process became less about the script and more about where we're headed as individuals, where we've been. Throughout the rehearsal process, unique relationships were being formed between the characters and, and in character. And uh, that, that was really good for us because we were allowed to come back and make changes to the script according to those relationships. It was crucial to get Steve Anderson, our VFX supervisor, in as soon as possible. Uh, if we were going to do all this stuff in camera, we needed to test it first. I had a lot of fun working on this with Shane and the department heads, coming up with more in-camera, old-school uh, solutions to the effects that, that were required, um, which is very much in keeping with the style of the film. But it's also my preferred approach because it gives us something for the DOP and the director to line up a shot. Um, it gives us interactive light and reflections on the surface. Uh, and it also gives us something for the actors to react and act towards. Uh, so when we get into post, even if we don't use the effect at the end of the day uh, that was in camera, we've got something that's actually casting light and, and interacting with the uh, live action performance. One of the first things we looked at in pre was uh, using a phase trick to drive uh, water drips or blood drips to look like they were falling forwards, stopping and reversing their action uh, in camera without having to rely on CG. And that's done by synchronising the phase of the vibration of the rig to the phase of the frame rate of the camera. And if they're ever so slightly off one way or the other, it looks like it's slowly going forwards or slowly, it's slowly going backwards. Perfectly in sync, you get a frozen moment. Spent a fair bit of time planning to do all of our holograms in camera on this show as well, um, which led us to develop the graphical interface uh, as well as all the content uh, in pre, ready to go on set. 
Um, some of the early tests were very encouraging and it didn't wind up in the film, but what it did give us is the interactive light. I mean, we, we still had the interface of the holograms projecting in free space, just on acting a spill onto the uh, actors, uh, which gave us great integration in post. It's six minutes from now. I don't have to tell you how important this mission is. Wait. George Little and um, Shane came up with a, a, an idea that they wanted a faceted type helmet, which looked a bit different to something we'd seen before. One of the things is, because the time is so uh, compacted, I've had to develop new techniques for actually getting things done really quickly. I developed a process uh, using um, rotational casting with urethane, and I've been churning a complete helmet out in about uh, 30 or 40 minutes. We've got an eight person squad and uh, so that means eight identical helmets but actually each of these helmets is individual to each of the operatives so the uh, lights are actually different and there's going to be different um, stickers and markings on each of them just so that they've got a bit of individuality. Week one, we're looking good, but as we start leapfrogging between studios, studio A and B, there's some pretty, uh, some pretty tight days there. But there's no other way around it because of actor availability and what the art department and set dresses can do and what lighting can do. Everyone's pushed. Everyone's just so it works on paper. So let's uh, hopefully it all goes to plan. So somehow we managed to get through a very hectic pre. Uh, we managed to find ourselves a new location, get the film fully cast, get the film fully crewed, and it was just a matter of surviving the next eight weeks. I think with all the obstacles that were thrown in our general direction, just to film on a day-to-day -day basis, we had smoke, steam, liquid goo, membrane stuff. We had uh, Studio A, Studio B working at the same time. We had prosthetics that we needed to do as well. And it was just ridiculously hot. We had to work under like extreme temperatures in summer. All right, it's going to go up about 15 degrees. Welcome to Infinity. Walking into an abandoned warehouse and fighting a space station is quite fantastic and awe inspiring. The sets were all really impressive, especially when you got to uh, walk through them and live in them for a little while. It was very creepy, but in a good way. There were a lot of um, storyboards sent to us via email, but then when we got onto the set, you can't compare drawings to what you see in the physical sense. It was mind-blowing. Uh, I, I loved the set. Uh, straight away, it sort of felt very alien. But I think the tunnels were amazing. It really set up that feel of like this busted down hell on earth. The stuff that brought more visual reality of the world we're in, everything just served so, so well. I, anything that helps you believe in the reality of where you're at, it's got to be good. It was bigger than what I thought it was going to be, like walking on set for the first day and seeing the size of the sets and the size of the production. I, I, I mean, I didn't really have an expectation, but it blew me away, the detail in the sets. So just over to my right, you see an expanse of set and light and all sorts of stuff. We've built corridors, rooms, space stations in this in fact, in this area, which was a big factory storage area. Another area similar next door. And so while we shoot here, uh, in amongst rooms and control rooms and tunnels and all sorts of bits and pieces, uh, they're building other sets next door and then we will go and shoot there and these will be deconstructed. And so for the last couple of months, we've gone between these two massive, massive areas. And then these things, um, and they were calling them halos and angels and all sorts of bits and pieces, but these, when they're lit up, are quite spectacular. And these are the, uh, the slipstream machines that slipstream east and west coast out of Earth and into various parts of the galaxy. One thing you'll discover about the Infinity set is every time you turn a corner or every time you go somewhere, you'll find blood everywhere. You go to the car showers, it's like there's been a massacre in there. So every time we finish a day's work, we go and scrub everything off. This place has become a character of its own. You know, when you walk through it and the way that Carl has lit it and, and, and the, the way that the beams of light come through the smoke and the pipes and the gauges and the, the dirt and grittiness, it's just amazing. You know, it's, you, you, it's hard to not believe you're here. You know, testament to the art department on the film. I mean, those guys worked literally round the clock. These guys worked no sleep, worked days on end, 
all through the weekends. There was never a point where our department were not on the film working for it. You know, scenic, the, the, the dressing of those sets you know, on the budget they had, it was, it was just an insane undertaking for every department, but art department on this film went so far above and beyond the, the cause. And when you watch the film, you know, again, it's t you see it all on the screen. You see what those guys did, it was fantastic. When we first arrive on the planet, for instance, it's in deep freeze. So uh, we have icicles, we have fog suggesting that. And of course, a lot of that uh, has to do with the coloration of the film. And Carl, uh, at this stage, it's, there's a blueness about it, there's a coldness about it. It's a great part of the, the process, the craft, is this, this exchange of information about the, the color palette and the lighting effects and so on. The lighting in this film uh, is very unusual because I didn't have what I really needed to light these sets. There was 21 sets altogether and some of them were quite large and because of our budget constraints, pretty much half the sets were lit with redhead open face lamps and blondie open face lamps and rock and roll park hands. And I, I think uh, really, ideally, they weren't suited to what I needed. But we managed out of that to create a look that suited the story and it just kind of worked. Everything just came together and worked. Things like fog on the ground, smoke in the atmosphere, a lot of the, the, the general things that you kind of take for granted in these type of films but were huge undertakings on a daily basis when, especially with the shooting style that we had, which was very sort of run and gun and very reactive to what was happening. And I think for all the departments that was, that was a big sort of challenge to have everything ready all the time. So whatever we needed was sort of there. If we wanted to go over here and do this, we could do that within reason. So after navigating our way through a very hectic pre, we finally got to day one and uh, we had Whit Carmichael and our director say a few words to rally the troops before we kicked off. Whether this is a moment that you're passing through in your life or, or it's a defining moment of your career, or whatever this is going to be, it's going to be something special whether you like it or not. My name's Whit. Uh, Today you're going to meet uh, my, my son and you're going to meet my beautiful wife and then in the next two months uh, all hell is going to break loose. The easiest set that we had to build was the, the apartment and so that was up first which is not really what we wanted to do because it, it was the start and the end of the film. If you think about the emotional journey that Dan has to go through or wit, it's not ideal to shoot in the first week. It was never going to be a simple first day, just to add a bit more difficulty to it. We had our first in-camera visual effect, which was the rear projection of the exterior of their apartment. This had gone through uh, several iterations, just trying to find what the world of tomorrow would look like. And so we worked up uh, some matte painted city views from the balcony of Witt's apartment and projected those uh, in the studio and it was fantastic because it gave us interactive reflection on the glossy surfaces and people's eyes and let you have, say, an out-of-focus foreground element, super soft, still with the background, not only behind it, but actually wrapping and refracting through. First day on the shoot and it was pretty emotionally harrowing and, you know, I had to shoot Wit's beginning of Wit's journey and the last scene of the movie, morning one, and. And you know, I could never have imagined what I was going to go through in the couple of months after that. My first AD, we have a very close relationship and he kind of understands my approach to everything and he's kind of really behind that. So he kind of knows how to, how to manage that, manage myself and manage the, the crew and the cast. It was a chaotic environment and Shana Bess has an amazing talent for helping people find their truths amongst the chaos. One of the um, processes that Shane uh, did as a director was to go complete method with his performance and that was to immerse them in the whole process as if they're living it. I'd never experienced this as a cinematographer and even some of the crew had never experienced that and I think after the first day of filming they were quite shocked and didn't know really how to react to that or how to respond to working with that. What I didn't expect was that one by one the entire cast and the crew would start working that way as the as the shoot went on. And the level of kind of commitment and the, and the depths that, that everybody went on this shoot was completely unexpected. The spark was calculated, the fire was not. Uh, I knew it would happen, but I didn't know how far or wide it would spread. Uh, and I think what was great about that was just the, the challenge then of the film was trying to contain 
the burn zone, was to try to make sure we knew where the edges of the fire were at all times, that it was always for the film and never just for personal gain or satisfaction or some sadistic you know, need. It was always, it was always, were we going, was this for the benefit of the film? Was this fire, this madness that sort of infused the set and the cast, was this beneficial? And uh, it always was. <laughs> In the initial stages of pre, I could see how much work Shane was doing from the shadows. He he was he was he was orchestrating this this grand master plan of how this thing will will all play out. The actors were given freedom, but they were given freedom in a playing field that he created. It's all about creating an environment and a space for them to go as far as humanly possible so that by the time they leave that set, there's nothing else left within the time and the constraints they had that they want to explore, they want to try, they want to kind of do. And the same for me, you know, I sort of don't want to leave a scene thinking, I wish I had it done that this way or this way. I kind of feel like once the truth or the right way is presented to us, we'll all organically feel that and just sort of go for it. Shane is like the most generous, lovely person you ever meet. He actually gives you the time and the, um, the time to kind of find things. You know, I, I have I've worked with Shane before on the movie Gabriel, so I'd like to think that I have an idea of how his psyche works. He's a very, very intense man, and I like that about him because he's passionate about what he does. And when we get together, the sparks fly, and that's that's beautiful, you know. Because we had all the backstory, we created much more of a family. It's like we've all known each other for 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 years, and we've all worked together, slipstreaming from one of the galaxy to another. It, it created a tense vibe too, because with a family, family are people too, and you have arguments, you have uh, disagreements, uh, and we had a lot of that. And I, was, I remember being on a set at one point, and, then, and I was just getting so frustrated with, with Paulie at one point, with his character, but it's great with him as well, and I, mean, I think it's because he's just, just sort of the, the, I think the, I think the characters bled into into the performers and, and who we were as people too and what we were doing. As the days went on and we threw ourselves in there with in, incredible you know, dedication and, and gusto, we were getting physically exhausted, mentally drained and tempers were starting to fray. At one stage, um, Seth and I ended up having a fight in the middle of the scene, which I think was half the actors and half the characters getting pissed off with each other and a poor little Dan stuck in between getting squashed and hammered. Fucking okay. fix okay. it, you okay. fucking goose! But it informed the scene and I think what we end up seeing on the screen is, is, um, is something that you just can't really manufacture. At the start of the production there was a great divide between the cast because there was half the cast that were completely down the river with myself uh, and there was the other half which wanted to keep it professional, keep doing what they'd done before. And as the film went on, uh, they very quickly learned it was either sink or swim. So you either, you either step up to what we're asking you to do or get left behind. And you know what, I'll cut you out and leave you on the floor. It doesn't matter. I was so passionate about t doing this story right and just seeing the most truthful outcome for each situation, regardless of what was written, regardless of, of what I even went into the day wanting. If the truth presented itself, we had to go for it. In this case, uh, I would have to say our director Shane Abess is a method director. And truthfully, I mean, why do, why do especially actors, I mean, th there's that need to want to explore a different type of person every single time. And it was more just trying to create the permission and the world for them to do that. And the most important part, the most important part is being allowed to work that way. Yeah. Being given permission to work that way. And yes, as an actor, we can give that to ourselves. But the captain of our ship who's steering us, our director, Shane. He's the one that made it possible. I mean, I've worked a lot. Never have I worked like this. For the first week or so, I, I actually found it extremely difficult to, to go with the flow because I'm there with the script and things are feeling like they're going, you know, two degrees that way or three degrees that way and I'm, I was, you know, freaking out a lot about where this story arc was going to end up or character arcs were going to end up, but we kept a close eye on everything as we went and as I started to witness the whole thing going down in a much more interesting way, then 
it became more about just monitoring everybody as they went and making any changes that we needed to make. They were all enhancements, but we were still making the exact same story we set out to make from the beginning. This isn't going to be a sit down, read your lines, do your shot, camera comes around, shoot this person, shoot that person. This is going to be uh, a challenging, dynamic, harrowing set where people have basically been given, not free reign, but have been given the green light to hold their fellow performers accountable if they don't think they're bringing the necessary commitment or the necessary depth of performance to, to what they felt Infinity was demanded. For that to happen, we had to live it. And that was always my thing going into this. I wanted to live this journey with a bunch of people and I wanted to experience the good and the bad. And I think that's probably, that was the, the seed that began the Infinity experience that everyone sort of talks about was this just blatant disregard for political correctness, for standard structure, for niceties about the process and just unrelenting focus on truth, commitment and trying to do something that, uh, that, that was different, you know, and, and just in its absolute brutal honesty, you know, within that kind of genre. It was all this tension in the air and it needed to explode at some point, something had to happen, and which it did. And when it did explode, it was better for everyone. It was like, then we got going. It was, it was chaos in there. There was absolutely no way to bullshit your way through any of the scenes. Quite often what you had was people calling other people out and wanting more, knowing when you weren't giving your best and forcing you to, uh, to do better. I can ask for something 10,000 times over and it's fine, but when another character asks another character for something and they can't deliver it, the pressure is unlike anything I've ever seen. Just not fucking giving a shit. You had your fucking money shot, all right, and that's it. I want the vulnerability, man. I can't fucking act unless you make me act. There was this energy and there was this aggression and there was this passion and this hunger for everyone in character to push everyone. People fought for the character. You. Shut up! What the fuck is wrong with you? What the fuck is wrong with you? Get what the fuck? Huh? Oh, God. Shut up! But by week two, all bets were off because everyone was playing the game. Everyone was had painted the wall paint on and was where I, they were much further ahead of where I thought they would be. The captain's screaming at Chester, Rex is screaming at the captains, people are screaming at everyone else. Yeah, God, back God, off! God, this game. Back the shit. fuck off! No matter what, everyone knew they were in it together. But they also knew that from that point on, you were accountable to the rest of the cast and you were accountable to the rest of the crew. And you were com completely accountable to Infinity. And so what that, that was by far the most challenging day as an actor I've ever had. But ultimately it was the most rewarding. And it was one of the mo performances that I'd be most proud of in my career when I look at it on screen. It's like, fuck, how did we get there? The bar was like keep making sure everyone stayed in there and was accountable, keeping everybody accountable. And um, if that meant by upsetting from character to character, uh, then that's what it had to be done, especially if people joined the film after it had been going for it couple of weeks, a few weeks, people were already quite deeply in there. Fucking give it to me, man! I want your fucking soul! Shut, Shut the again. fuck up! Fuck you! Get another fucking guy! Get another fucking guy! It's bullshit! I mean, it was madness, but at the same time, um, we knew what we wanted to achieve. Shane had a wonderful way of getting into your brain and getting into your skin. Um, and I think he does it with everyone. He kind of... Uh, says and does things in order to provoke a reaction and he's constantly playing mind games and you gotta be on your toes and uh, <laughs> be mindful of your responses. Um, but uh, a wonderful human being and uh, I wouldn't trade any of those days in for anything. We were, we were given the liberty and, and the freedom uh, to, to explore what we wanted uh, for our characters in, in those scenes and, and yeah, we just, we were the characters and we responded as the characters and there was not there wasn't that much rehearsing because we couldn't rehearse because I didn't know like I didn't know what Morgan was going to do or Bren was going to do in the scene and so we just bounced off each other so every take was different every take was raw and truthful and heartbreaking and I, I was I was taken on a journey you know Claire took me on a journey there is no way that that 
the performance that, that I ended up with on screen was, was in that way that was possible without being pushed every day by in a, in a different way by every single one of the cast that, that came in and, and just committed. I think like none of them ever have uh, before because, and that's their words, not mine, because I think we are, f as a cast, are kind of forever unified now by, by this movie and by this process of making this movie. Did I like it at the time? No, I fucking I wanted to rip someone's head, a lot of people's heads off. But I realised the value of it and it was, it was very, very good and I don't think you, I mean, you can't do it all the time. It's got to, it was, that was the uniqueness of that set and those people. It was very volatile and tense and I couldn't be more grateful for that. By knowing who I was, it just, it, it, little things tipped me over the edge. Like when we came back, someone asked me about my kids and my family. It just was like, bang, someone hit me in the back of the head with a sledgehammer. Where did that come from? I didn't know that was going to happen. How many children do you have? When he said it, the way Morgan went to answer, knowing all that Morgan had been through on the film, I was behind the split and I just instantly was like rocked. I have one on the way. Like my foundations were rocked because I couldn't believe someone asked him that knowing what he'd been through and he couldn't either. And to watch him try and hold that together and then break down and then try and get the answer out. It's like, there's no performance here. This is just, you're, the character and you are one and the character's answering and the character's having an emotional response and it's owning you completely. It was kind of like this shared trauma that we all went through that we're still kind of forever unified by. As the cinematographer, we tried to just take a kind of a back seat, let the actors do their thing and the, the cinematography kind of was dictated by that approach in the sense of we became observers. Everything just unfolded in the frame rather than us move the camera or dictate certain elements. Now, occasionally we implemented a kind of a style approach uh, in certain scenes where madness was created, but it was very a very simple approach. It wasn't over the top and very subtle. We were often very reactive to the performances, very reactive to what we were seeing. So. Uh, if what we weren't locked in to something technically where like we had to shoot it this way and it had to be that we knew the style of film we were making um, but when the performance dictated something better we always went with it we had initial storyboards in, in the process and ideas and stuff they came through but they weren't necessarily the same shots that we discussed in pre-production I think we we had a, such an organic process that we reacted what was going on and as time went on during the shoot uh, we kind of felt that was the better approach because it, it gave an honesty and gave the film integrity, especially visually. So as, as actors owned their characters a lot more and were given the freedom to experiment, we would need to adjust their arc accordingly. We would often chat each night about where's the film still sitting? You know, if we've changed this, how does that affect that? And we've got to make sure that we pay off that so that the film still has a, you know, a beautiful arc to it. Put it this way. Every scene in the movie is from the script, but the way it's written is completely different now. Meaning that um, everyone came forth and said, look, you know, this is what my character would do, what he didn't do. And Shane was kind enough to say, okay, well, look, show me what you got. We'll try it. If it works, fine. If it doesn't, you know, we'll, we'll go back to the script. And that, again, was another great challenge of the edit and the shoot and the script across it was managing that balance so that the story still had the same arc, it was the same story. Um, but wherever the script, we pushed the train off the tracks, it still was the same movie. We weren't making a different film at any point. Another huge factor for the film for me is sound in general, but also uh, music. I wanted earpieces when they're in their helmets that I could talk to them and also play the music in takes. Another thing was using the PR on set for everybody in that moment, for the cast and the crew, to feel closely connected to what the energy is supposed to be of this scene. And so I actually did a huge playlist and talked with Brian about it before the film began and we actually had a, a soundtrack to the shoot. You can kind of manipulate mood or tone or you can inform an entire cast and crew what we're kind of doing right now and drop everyone into a zone or into a mood by playing music over the entire set. Usually it was a lot of death metal, awesome. Esoteric 
uh, electronica, but all very, very effective. It wasn't kind of a thing we just put on any old song and play is very specific and you'd have actors asking in their scenes, can I have my theme? It was the soundtrack of our emotions on Infinity and it carried us, it helped us. I don't know if I can listen to those tracks again without breaking down. Um, ah. Music on set was just extremely, extremely helpful and in certain places it brought everyone in sync to where we need to be. And I think the music was a beautiful way for me to talk to everybody on that set without having to tell them something specifically. Feel this, how does this make you feel? Let's go, you know, it's fantastic. Man, cut, thank you. Good one guys, that's it, thanks a lot. And then, and then Matt, you know, Matt being our, our lead producer on the film, Matt was really instrumental in, you know, and, it's, and it's, a, it's a huge testament to a great producer to still control the film, still have a voice in the film, but never become so intrusive to the process that you derail the film. You know, day to day, you know, he was trying to run 500 things to make sure that, you know, when I was there on the set and all these actors and the crew were there, we weren't aware of the world around us, you know, and that was a huge thing in this film was, once I stepped foot in the Infinity with that crew, I was never aware of anything that happened outside, you know, but I know there was a thousand moving parts and that's also Jackie and Danae and Rose as well, you know, is there was this huge storm happening, but we were always at the eye of the storm was the shoot. It was the calm center with which we could lose our absolute minds, uh, knowing that somehow out here, there was this big tornado happening, which was keeping us in the, in the center of the storm. One of the things you want to do with the film was have as much in camera as possible, meaning, you know, even with the visual effects, uh, as little green screen, as little CGI, kind of enhanced uh, sort of moments as we could, just to try and keep it real and also get that old flavour of, of the era we were trying to do. And I was really lucky because because our producing team and the visual effects team and everyone were really supportive of, of doing that, you know, kind of they weren't looking for easy ways out. You know, we took a harder route in many ways to get there. So, you know, with the, uh, with the control room, all those screens being real, you could actually operate the station for real from that control room, uh, which was fantastic watching it all sort of go down and it gave the characters a sense of depth and they understood what was happening by being able to go, okay, when I type, when I say this and I type it in, it actually happens. It's Pacific Ocean, just off San Francisco. Coming in here and you know, seeing, the, seeing the plans and thinking about the sort of lenses we're going to be filming with, uh, 32 screens in anamorphic lenses, pulling focus on people's faces, looked like an absolute nightmare. So yeah. first response was, yeah, we're going to do that for real. Yeah, having a, a text-only interface was, was, was bang on. And that's exactly what they had written yeah. in, the, in the script. Every night was programming screens and you know, specific scripted events for the following day. So I think I think there was two days where we were shooting in here, but we kind of weren't really focusing on the screens, so I was just plugged into the back and just Madness. smashing out some more. <laughs> what are you doing? Oh, I'm, just, I'm just making some more graphics for them. <laughs> Ding! Pops up on the screen. Check it out. The, the sets the sets were incredible. I mean, the sets, considering that we were pretty much in a factory in Gladesville, and the fact that we got to go to work every day and, and play in these sets. My favourite set was probably the lab set, to be honest. I, I don't know, I kind of, I just, I, I liked that space. It was kind of clinical and I loved the kind of blues and, yeah, I really liked, I really liked that set a lot. to sort of see how initial ideas like slipstreaming out of a room like this ended up changing into something like this. Uh, so this is Warehouse B. This is the second of our two infinity warehouses with so much stuff going on. Uh, in here is a lot of building, a lot of construction, and then we use uh, the area for other sets as well. And then if you've seen the movie, you'll recognise this is where we leave from. And we already shot in here yesterday. Already it's sort of being pulled apart and bits and pieces used for, for other other sets, other stuff that they're shooting today and stuff they're shooting in the next couple of days. I think these are actually stolen from another location, so I've heard, but don't quote me on that. 
I saw like 15 cans of the uh, Christmas snow spray and I'm pretty sure that's what this has been covered in. Pretty awesome looking set. Uh, I don't want to give too much away but uh, that's foam. That's just foam. So this is where I'm living uh, while I'm here at Infinity. Uh, some people call it a bedroom, call it the cell. Um, it's where I come uh, between scenes if I've got lunch break or, or whatnot, or overnight because we wrap quite late and start quite early. So welcome to the cell. I've gone back to my bachelor roots. There we go. Oh yeah. Single bed, coffee machine. I do happen to have a three piece suit and a tuxedo and a bag out here because I have been shooting dance with the stars at the same time. Don't tell me. Uh, makeup and wardrobe. Very important. Uh, makeup do an amazing job in here, particularly uh, on days when you've got the entire East Coast team in. Me personally, just I get covered in dirt and oil and cuts and crap uh, every morning. I just come and spend the first hour of my day getting covered in a product called Good Looking Hair. Go figure. Makeup was interesting. When we get to the second half of the film, to infection, um, let's really let's really work as artists and try and and try and paint something different. Let's try and paint a different picture. Claire, when she's she's, she's sick, they worked really hard on that. You know, there was just a certain look and an aesthetic. You know, Luke Ford's pasty, sickly. You know, Chester's where Chester gets to, and trying to find what it was that sort of motivated that look or that feel. When Shane asked me to come in and, and actually play the frozen body, I think initially they, they were going to do some kind of clay model or, or, or some kind of CGI thing and, and they decided that it was going to be more real to come in and, and get me essentially looking like the frozen dude and then sit there you know, for, for three quarters of the day in a very still position. So a couple of people have said to me they didn't realise it was, it was me. It was a very interesting experience. What the fuck is that? Prosthetic effects uh, was something that was a real big challenge for, for, for Luke because we set him a massive task, you know, to, and we were kind of lucky in the sense that we wanted to keep a very real aspect to it. So I didn't want the film going too far into kind of zombie, crazy, morphing sort of territory. The practical effects had to be sort of, you know, minimal. It was a challenge from, from day dot on the time and budget because it was basically Luke and Tristan, the two guys in that department that had to do the entire film. So, you know, I'd often like, you know, wake up at three in the morning because I was staying on set, you know, and I'd still see those guys in there working. We, we had uh, Claire's back, which was a huge apply that took like over six hours for the one shot, you know, but we needed to show that she was changing the, the apex on the frozen guy with the spikes sort of coming through. The apexes in general, uh, stunt guns, because we broke a lot of guns on this film. You know, there, there's a lot of stuff that you wouldn't expect, you know, uh, prosthetics to have to do that they did, they did have to do on the film. Very important on a, on a film like Infinity to make sure that the colour of blood is correct. So a lot of the guys in the prosthetics department practicing different shades. And then uh, these things are amazing. These are the actual props that we used in the movie. Um, so that's basically saying that a single cell of blood has been infected uh, with the opus and it's transformed into that to a single dominant cell. The warehouses that we've taken over for Infinity have got, so they're kind of like rabbit warrens, there's offices and tunnels and stairwells and everything everywhere and, and um, you don't really turn a corner uh, without finding something that takes you straight back to Infinity. And so if it's not fake blood stains everywhere, um, it's stuff like this. It's a few body parts. Um, these are actually active scars, so these are basically um, plastic transfers that would go on different body parts and makeup will go over them. With, with blood and bits and pieces. These are the West Coast plasma guns that we're going to be using when we slipstream. Costumes had a very tight budget for a sci-fi film and we only had one copy of everyone's uniform and there was one spare. So with the schedule it was the kind of thing where you can't shoot him with a bullet because that's once there are holes in that we can't shoot this scene with a hole in it. And Shireen was great in, she's very resourceful with the West Coast guys uniforms, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a combination of of a lot of types of body armour that we wear right now in motocross and SWAT and all that sort of stuff and then she sort of put it all together. For the East Coast guys it was about designing a functional suit that could pick up highlights of light. Carl and, and uh, George wanted some orange in it, something that kind of made it pop. So it wasn't just these black suits against a, a dark background. 
First I was really resistant to that because I wanted it to be more of that sort of uh, just a typical dark kind of safer sort of space but um, you know I was reminded well, you're not going for safety and you're on this film so why do it with a costume. These things are triple shield right? Yeah they were good to last. Temp skyrocketing but your seals will hold trust me. Already. Hey, Phil, are you enjoying the helmets? No, absolutely not. They're killing us. The helmets on Infinity were uh, probably the most painful experience that I've ever had on a film set. They would break apart, the lights would switch off. The cast couldn't really <laughs> breathe properly in it. <gasps> Put a helmet on and you shut the visor and... It's like having your head in a plastic bag. <laughs> it's okay for about 30 seconds and then the things start to go a little bit fuzzy. The visors kept popping open because of the heat. You know, you've got to see the car's face. So there was, there was lights, there's a ring of lights that were put, that Carl put into the, the helmets themselves, which were connected through the back of the helmet down into their backpack, which was a battery that kept dying. But they would lose their battery power so quickly to change the battery was quite time consuming. We set everything up and be ready to go and you could still waste an hour on the helmets. You'd be halfway through the best take of the film and someone's light would die. And it's like, fuck, you know, was, they were really much more of a challenge than I thought they'd be. I thought building the, the, the sets and filling them full of light and, and magic was gonna be hard, but those fucking helmets. I, I think uh, one of the guys that uh, was taking care of the helmets had a family tragedy and wasn't able to continue on the film. So we went from having a specialist in that area to having to give some of the people in art department with less, less experience, and God bless them, they, they had to try and figure this stuff out as they went. So we didn't have time for, to test them on camera until we were actually there on the set. Oh. Uh, 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 uh. Three, two, one. Oh. There's only a handful of key stunts. Obviously the end fight scene, there was the fight scene between Chester and Wit in the sick bay. There was some pencil drops that we did through the ladder. There was going through a glass wall. <laughs> and throwing back onto a wall. I think it was, was it Rex and Harris? <laughs> They're all pretty important to the film. And it always adds a nice flair when you have a bit of action. Which jump was one of those sequences that we had to start in pre. We had to start doing animatics and storyboards early on to see if it was achievable. And if it was, to make sure the planning was done right. We knew there were five or seven shots in the sequence. Logistically, we had to create a couple of different sets, each with their own specific purpose. We had to create two tunnels uh, facing opposite each other. So each one had their own limitations and customizations, things like railings that would come on and off. Then there was the large tower. You can never actually build a tower high enough. That's one thing we learned. But hats off to the stunt guys who just threw themselves everywhere. Even Dan took the plunge on one particular take. <laughs> We had an amazing stunt team. Those guys were really willing just to put themselves on the line. There's a lot more stunts in the film than you'd think. Throwing the guy through the pipe, the pipe was never supposed to break, but he hit it that hard, he, he busted it open. And these guys have rehearsed this thing for, for, for weeks on end. And then um, on the day it was like, we got the first half, which I was happy with. And then I was done with that and I wanted something different in the water. And then it's the stunt doubles, the whole thing. And then Dan pulls Luke out of the water at the end there. <laughs> From the fight out, you know, I'm pretty proud of that. Pretty proud of that. Uh, I'm proud of the whole film, but I feel like those last 30 minutes of the film are really kind of, that's where, that's the point of the movie, you know, in those moments, the point. There's great scenes all the way through, but for me, the last half hour of that film is kind of, was why we made it.
the the speech the speech to the station at the, at the end of the movie I mean, we were shooting that scene and Shane suddenly appeared next to me checking one of the lights I thought what what are you doing there and I look over and Brian's got the broom and Brian's like bawling his eyes out and I spoke to them that night at the pub and I was like what the hell happened and he goes man when you did that did this ad, ad lib thing where I where I um, did like a key kind of moment of every character throughout the movie in like a key moment and then the last thing Lisa we saw Lisa say to Wit and I kind of ad-libbed this whole thing and Shane said he was watching at the monitor and when I did that he suddenly started bawling but they had all these people on set that day so he came and crawled underneath the set to get out of there to try and not cry to then he pretended he was checking a light all he was doing was trying not to cry in front of everybody on the set and I look over and Brian was bawling so maybe maybe that scene that scene's pretty special I mean, there's so much of Shane and myself in that speech. There's something very important in that message about a man wanting to provide. And then the end of the film, you know, is really my statement to the world. That speech that Wit gives, I wish I could give that to everybody right now around the world that I'm seeing at war with one another, you know, in this constant conflict uh, with each other. That's actually the point. And it was actually a documentary um, by Tom Shadiak. I, I went and saw a screening of that. Uh, it was the I Am documentary and it was actually all about how uh, domination never works. Cooperation is the secret to survival in species, in, in society, you know, and, and I think too many times people feel that domination is the key to success. I enforce my will upon you and that will make everything right once when there's only one opinion, one focal point, one, one sort of way forward. And, and that's kind of, uh, that's what the membrane tries to do to wit in this film and, and, and he teaches it basically bad deal you know what I mean look what you did here and so it's really the film like all good science fiction is a global statement um, at the very end to, to what I wish the world would listen to right now cooperate stop trying to dominate after everything we'd gone through on this movie, you know, and the, the whole pre, the intensity of pre and the intensity of that shoot. Uh, by the time we got to the post, I thought that nothing could be harder than that. There could be nothing that would challenge us more than that pre and that shoot. Uh, and we were kind of, I think, all excited to kind of take six months of really just, you know, d dissolve ourselves into our movie and, and, and sort of play with it. And uh, it, just, it just got harder and harder and harder. And I, I would have to say, professionally and even in personal life, it was one of the hardest experiences I've ever had to go through, the post-production on this film. After such an intense production, people did think post would be a little bit easier, however we were wrong with that, and like everything on Infinity, it, it has been quite an intense experience. I know that post is such a big thing for Shane and the Storm Vision team, um, so I just knew how much, as good as the picture cut was, how it was all going to come to life. Um, with all the effects, the sound, the music. Um, it was going to be an exciting process and I lived up to it. You know, post was, was um, uh, more intense than shoot in some ways. When we came back for pickups, I know it was tricky for Dan, probably and a lot of us, because we kind of knew they'd be there somewhere and we had to try and maintain the energy that was in the original shoot and bring it all the way across to pickups. I think for a lot of us that was, the pickups was that last cathartic bit of like, fuck you, get away, get away. You know, we had to do the wit as the membrane sort of guy being reborn. Uh, we did all the crazy wits in the tunnel. We shot him on the train, you know, which actually stars our Cheshire DIT guy. And if you look carefully in the background, our producer Matt is actually sitting right behind him. And then a scene which we had originally written to be massive, which was wit was supposed to on his first day at work get called in and actually go down to the pen and watch two teams jump before him. And they came back all bloodied from Infinity and then he jumped and we went with him to Infinity and saw the battle that went on, the miners attacking everybody, Ponta got infected, um, all the way up to Whip, basically blowing the compartment housing and freezing the station. But when we lost Colonel, uh, we had to drop a massive segment from the film and that was the one that went. And I had kind of fought for something, some version of this to come back in and. Uh, I know Matt was pretty adamant that we should do that too. So we were on the same page with it. And we kind of, we had to try and figure out something, you know, that was economical, but we could still cut into the vision and see a team go and come back to see something had happened out there to set up the idea of Infinity 
as uh, as not not a very fun place to be. Go in. Five, four, three, two, one. I think I'm glad that sequence is in the film because. I think it, it goes beyond just that sort of room and shows you a little bit of what, it sort of sets up the idea of what jumping and slipstreaming is before you, before you actually get to do the big one with the East Coast. You know, Adrian and I obviously have worked together before and we have quite a, uh, again, I come back to that word, there's a lot of trust between us. He became quite immersed in the edit himself. And when we do days like Rex or the control room scene with Chester and Wit losing their minds, Adrian would cut like that. Slow it down, come. No, 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 no. I can't fucking be here anymore. I want you to trust me. You want me yeah. to trust you. I look at the size of this fucking Hang guy. Get some fucking balls. Oh. The two-hander with um, Wit and Chester, there was four and a half hours for that scene in total. So I thought, yeah, okay, give it to me. We'll see what happens. And then I started going through it and thought, yes, how can you make sense of this? The result is great. It's awesome because you can get, you can achieve something that you could never do with a script. I really loved watching Shane and Rusty work. Rusty really pushed Shane and challenged him on everything. If Shane wanted something in the film, he had to prove it and he had to earn it. It was just like when we were back on set. I left the shoot and then I had an editor <laughs> that was down the same rabbit hole. Uh, because he was trying to continue the feeling of Infinity, he didn't want to let that, whatever it is that jumps beyond the screen for Infinity, he wanted to keep that energy uh, going. Mentally, we did go with the flow with that film because it is a, a film with a, people going crazy. And we, we did at times had to let ourselves go a bit crazy and to achieve what we had to achieve. We came up with a style or lack of style, whatever you'd like to say, but uh, a method or whatever, whatever it is to suit this film, it had just come, had to come organically out of the process. There wasn't any particular style imposed on it. Um, the film imposed it on us what it, what it needed to be to be faithful to Shane's vision. Honestly, to get it all to make sense, you know, to get people understanding that, that the thread you know, would kind of work, work around continuity, work around um, people trying things in the background of scenes and work around the, the, this commitment to just going with the moment, going with the honesty of the moment. And I think he's done a great job of, of really finding the meat in all that and threading a story through some of the most craziest scenes. You know, if I, I wish I could put all the Rex's outtakes on the thing because that is a tour de force in itself. There's like four different versions of how he gets to the point of killing himself. You stand there, you fuck, like you fucking are so important. You are so important. You are nothing wit. I will tell you what time is. <laughs> oh, no, 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 Easy! Who is that? That is Menzies, he is part of your team. Don't do this, you have a choice. Oh, shut up! Oh, 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 fuck! You fucking dog! My own! My fuck! Look at me! Not only was it hard because it was complex, because of all the ad libbing, the intensity of the scene um, was very heavy because there was a lot of aggression in the scene. So listening and watching that aggression for hours and hours, day after day, really, um, really, I think it did get to Shane and, and myself to the point that we, we had to swear at each other and we had to really sort of embody the character a little bit to get through it. You know, at the end of it, we had over a two hour cut and we kind of all had to sit together and Matt, Brett and Sid and myself and Aaron, we had to try and figure out what what the film could be at a shorter sort of time to get it down to like closer to the 100 minute mark. And originally Montoli, it was all about introducing him on the station. Carl and I spent a lot of time designing um, how we would open the film in that way. But then when we watched it, people were kind of, there was Infinity and then there was the future and then we we're back to Infinity and people weren't really sure because already, we already with the script had gone off track as much as we could. We'd already tried to subvert every expectation we could along the way to keep people guessing what was going to happen. 
And it just felt like one too many times at the start to have people going, who's this guy? And then we meet this guy and then he disappears and these guys take over and then they're on a station and they've got to find him and this guy shows up again. And well, initially with me, my character was supposed to be opening the scene and I think it was about 12 or 13 minutes of me wandering around the space station um, with this, uh, you know, contagion within me. I guess because the test audiences didn't understand when I came back later on who I was, that that had to be changed in terms of the story. Um, so it's, it is quite interesting to see how, a f how much a film can change from script to screen. Um, and it all comes down to telling the story and making the story clearer for the audience, I guess. So we actually put him in the scene where Chief talks about him, we actually cut him in physically there, you know, and, um, and I, think it, I think it works much better. Uh, so what we end up doing then is taking the end of the film, which is all those guys ad-libbing just in the moment answering the question, the characters answering the question very honestly. Um, it, we actually took some of their best moments and put it at the start, so the audience kind of thinks, what's just happened here? Uh, and then by the time you get to the end of the film, you've forgotten about that, and you kind of think, oh, this was, you know, this is all a full circle kind of thing. So, you know, th th there's, that, was, that was one of the biggest changes in the structure of the film, was that the start completely changed to be more of a flashback. I want to clear you. I want to Can send I get you the home. fuck out of here now? But I need answers. Can Sir, stay with me. The I'm looking at you. Visual effects on the film were, were pretty massive, and the trick was to try and hide them. You kind of know the big CG shots in the film, but you know there's most of the ones that you won't know. There was a lot of invisible effects in Infinity, a lot of prosthetics fix-ups and rig removals and things like that. There's over 300 shots in total, and a lot of people don't see that, which is good. That's what we wanted. And a lot of that was helped by getting so much in camera and, and planning. If we hadn't have achieved what we did on set in camera, it would have been a completely different beast. There's no way we could have accomplished so many shots with the timeline and budget that we had. One of the other things that really stood out to me was the, the, the combination of practical on-set effects and then merging with the, eventually the VFX that were to be done in post-production. Extremely impressed with the interaction of Steve Anderson as our VFX supervisor and his uh, you know, VFX house orb. The only way to achieve so many shots in such a short amount of time was to split the workload. So we had a core group of in-house uh, VFX artists at Orb VFX and then we also had some remote artists that looked after uh, specific sequences or shots. Uh, things like the black room uh, sequence for example where we've got all the UI displays appearing for the chief. So all that was designed and animated by one particular artist and done off-site. Other sequences that we sent off-site were things like Wit's eyes where we could see the edges of contact lenses which we needed to touch up or uh, the script called for his eyes to move or change or be more dilated or less than what we got on the day. So sending those kinds of shots off to one artist meant we had a consistency across shots and sequences. One of the big shots that we actually tried to get as much in camera as possible was the Montoli conveyor belt. We had a conveyor belt with giant chunks of ice moving outside the window, so when we came in to film it, the camera goes through the window and we see the ice moving along the conveyor. It, it just didn't quite work in post. We wanted more scale to the room because the main thing with these kinds of shots was to make sure Infinity didn't feel too claustrophobic. We, we needed some moments where we gave the audience a chance to take a breath from all the narrow corridors and hallways. So in the end we thought it best to just remove the conveyor belt completely and do a full CG extension. We did actually use some of the elements of the ice moving on the conveyor belt. You can see those in the control room uh, on the monitors in there and also you can see little cards moving projected inside the conveyor belts of the N Montoli conveyor belt shot. Within the, the fact that we wanted to do everything for real in camera, we tried as much as we could and then just where it was went too far, the things that we just couldn't we just couldn't build because literally the set wasn't big enough. There were two approaches when doing the set extensions in Infinity. Uh, the first was more of a traditional matte painting where we would project on as a 2D card into the live action plate or if there was a bit of camera movement or parallax change we might create some 3D geometry and then project the 2D onto that. And that worked pretty well for most of the time. The other method was photogrammetry in which Steve Anderson would take a series of photographic plates on set and then that would be brought into 3D software and then turned into geometry, which could then be uh, projected with the live action plate in 2D. There was a lot of 
world to be added by the visual effects team and that was a, that was a long and laborious process for, for those guys. But what it did was just give this amazing sense of the, the, the isolation and the cold and, the, and the, the, the distance away from Earth of this world. I mean, it was really, really isolated. When you see the big wind turbines going and the wind kind of howling across Infinity, you kind of realise what a harsh, cold, horrible place it was. When I finally saw the, the, the finished product with, with all the visual effects in there, particularly you know, with some of the stuff like with Wit's big jump or seeing how long some of the corridors are, or, I was so impressed with the, with the scope. It just lifted the look and feel of the movie and helped sell our story, no doubt. So a lot of hard work that went on once we wrapped. Brian's score really is the voice of Infinity. It really kind of groans and moves and to have its soul broadcast and, and come up through the score, it's such a powerful and evocative way to give life and a voice to an otherwise unseen character. Brian's score on this really is lightning in a bottle. Now, I've worked with Brian a lot before and I've seen Brian go to dark places and do intense things, but nothing like this, nothing like this. He was completely transformed in that post process. And I think in many ways, he was a great support to myself and it was a great support to the cast and the crew on the set. And I think when it came time for the score, that was his. That was his time to own that. That was his time to say, cool guys, I've seen you like bulls in a, in a, in a paddock charging around doing what you did, now it's my turn. Now it's my turn to show you guys what that sounds like to me. What I see when you show me the worst parts of yourselves, now let me show you the worst part of myself and hopefully we make some kind of beautiful magic. The energy of the set echoing into the scoring process was a blessing in disguise. There's no relief from tension in Infinity, in, in, the, in the soundtrack. It's relentless. It just stays present through every single scene. There was a fear of overscoring. Shane and I were very careful to make sure that we weren't overscoring every single moment, but it felt good. It feels good. If it feels good, then it's great. Where he went was, was somewhere completely I felt at a cellular level, Brian became this movie. And I feel that there was every fiber of his being that, that became the musical voice, you know, of, of, of what we see and hear in the film. And I think the score is so unique for Infinity. The score is very tonal. It's reacting off the tones, not just the drama, but the tones and the, and the actual picture itself has a very strong voice. It, its tonal palette is very influential. Uh, and I only saw him three times in the whole scoring process of the film because everything he was doing, once we discovered the tone of the film and we're happy with the tone, he was just, he'd go away for two or three weeks at a time and just work and write. Nothing else exists. It's all encompassing. You are the score. You are one of the characters. There are no walls in the studio. It's black. There are two screens. There's a keyboard. There are instruments everywhere. and you're reaching out and you're just expressing what everybody's feeling. And then I remember Brian just disappeared for about a week uh, and then just sort of came out of the cave and said, I think I've got the theme for Infinity. You know, it's a simple theme, but I, think it, I don't think I've heard it before. I think it works. And he played it to me over the phone uh, and I knew as soon as I heard it, I was like, wow, you've, you've done it. There's a visceral emotion behind every single scene and the, the, we ne you need to find that and there's no way of finding that by just dialing it in on surface level. We've, you've got to dig a little deeper at times. I feel like even the music's a little bit infected, a little bit sick in this film. There's something about it which kind of, you know, I'm really proud of what he did on this. I think it's, I think it's an amazing score. I, I, I wish I could clearly articulate what it is that the score is, is doing to, to have the voice that it does. but. I think I'd be opening up that Pandora's box all over again. The last 20 minutes of the film is just a music marathon. I mean, it wasn't planned that way initially, but it, it begged for it because of the closure of all these characters. And as we 
as we come in with Witten Chester to take that final stretch, you can hear the shift in the music at that point is just completely emotional. Sound design was always going to be a massive undertaking and sound something that I really value a lot in the experience. I really do always believe it's 50% of the experience and when we're on set, even back at script stage, I'm, I'm relying on sound for certain things. When you read one of Shane's scripts, the words and the sounds literally jump off the pages. So the sound design for this film was going to be a massive undertaking. Like the West Coast attack, it's one room, it's one set. So we had to know that there was enough sound elements there to create this idea that there was a big war happening outside, that all hell was breaking loose outside of this room. As I was seeing rushes, more and more rushes of the film, I used to see the film it was just becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. And once when I've seen some of the VFX, you were just going, okay, this is just not going to be an average science fiction film. This is going to be something that's, you know, look great and we have to then make, make sure that it sounds great as well. In Natasha's favour I think he did a great job of, of just really being resilient and, and being persistent with the sound on this film you know with Brian and myself as well riding him the whole way to just keep going keep going get everything we could in there. It was one of the projects that uh, it's very it was very hard to find a sound that actually matched the picture. We went through so many different stages of creating different sounds and we would create a, a certain sound effect or certain uh, atmos and then we get really excited and then we put it against the picture and we go oh it doesn't fit the picture where we started we sort of we tried to keep as far away from the libraries as we possibly could so we used a lot of recordings that we did done in the studio uh, used all kinds of uh, recorded everything we could possibly think of uh, a lot of tape machines, uh, anything that makes movement. Uh, also, we had some stuff from the set that we try to uh, use. And with a lot of new processing, whatever we did to it, it really felt new. So a lot of times they did the work against the picture. We didn't kind of want to have that, that cleanliness of current sound sort of scape. So we've gone back again to that late 70s, early 80s sound design and looked at like how did the foley sound a little bit scratchy it had a little bit of there's a lot of warts you know and all inside the sound design of the film we wanted that we wanted to have you know a little bit of hiss and little things that don't quite work and a little bit of scratchy dialogue and we just wanted to keep that kind of organic thing of like if we couldn't have gone through the filters and cleaned it all up like we can now what would it have been like back in the day basically at the end it was just like whatever felt good rather than thinking this is this like you know this is too modern or like if when we put a beeps against it, you go, no, that feels good. And uh, it, I think just needed to match the picture. That was the main thing with the sounds. The big door just before the beat comes in. And it, that was just a fun job because as I was starting to create the effects and uh, I said, okay, this is open. Then it feels like doors opening more and more and more. And I just kept adding. And it felt like door opening just went forever. Be careful. <laughs> two seconds before I light you up. Working with Shay was a great experience. Uh, I've never worked with director before that was so sound intensive. Uh, Shay really wanted to know and understand a process, uh, how we get to certain sounds, why he wanted to know the reasons behind that. And he basically needed to own the soundtrack. He really understood where is this heading. On the projects like this, where there is so much work, the scope is just enormous. Uh, it's great to work with someone who actually know what they want because we didn't have as much time to have a lot of different options so we could try and test. We were sort of basically, we needed to get it right and keep moving on. 
And that was a good thing with Shane, that he was just really understood the process, yes or no, and we could just move on. Metal on metal, let's move. When I got to the end of the film, and people started to send the film, I was really proud that all the hard work and all that sort of extra steps that we'd taken, it, it, it started to resonate off the screen. You know, at the, at the early screenings, people really, they really got the insanity of the movie. They really got that, whatever it was, that they'd kind of gone beyond just the movie making, that extra, that energy that you can't quite explain in some films. Um, the fact that the majority of people really were feeling that, that was the best thing for me because we worked so hard to get that. We worked so hard to, to try in a time when everyone knows everything that's happening and everyone, everything's predictable and it's all disposable. Um, we didn't do that, you know, we, we definitely have not made a disposable movie in any way, shape or form. Whether people love it or hate it, um, we want to do something different. We want to do something that set up tradition and then defied it as it went along. I'm extremely proud of what we've achieved. There's no doubt about that. And uh, musically speaking, it's a highlight in my career to date. Um, I refer to Infini affectionately as, as my sick dog. It's, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's an infectious love affair. I, I care for it and I've nurtured it for so long, but it's now time to set it free. Uh, I, th I, think, I think Infinity will be a, a turning point in, in a lot of people's careers from this movie, you know, from, from this experience. Um, and I know it's certainly a, a huge, huge turning point in mine. The feeling of of coming onto set every day on the way to and even on the way home. If, for me, it feels like the real life was Infinity and Infinity happened. Inf it happened. And, and when we went home to sleep, it was just so that we could sleep enough to come and live Infinity. He made you want to give your best to the film. He made you want to go above and beyond. And when you can have someone motivate you like that for your job, for your, for your acting, for your film, that, that's, that's the passion, isn't it? That's the love. And when you, you know, you're willing to walk through a fire for the film and for your director, and then you know you're going to end up with something that you're proud of. Did I honour that with every cell possible? Did I give as much as I humanly possibly could for the efforts that go into such a um, piece of work? Well, if I can answer yes, then I'm happy. And um, so I'm happy for the whole team, the team of filmmaking. More than I expected. I think it, it's come together really well. Um, and it, it definitely has a look that we can all be proud of. I mean, it's, it, it doesn't feel like you know, a really small budget film made in some warehouse in Gladesville. It looks like a big Hollywood movie in a way. But, you know, no one's ever done a film like this in Australia before. You know, and you can see why. Because there's a lot that goes into it. There's, like, people don't think of it. People might go, oh, okay, you know, you write something on a space station or on a planet or... Uh, and they've got space suits and space helmets. But the reality behind actually producing something like that is really difficult. I think audiences will uh, be definitely affected emotionally by the experience of it watching Infinity. Um, it takes you on a, a kind of a, a very intense journey. You've got something really unique here, something really, really unique, and you'll, and you'll see it, you'll definitely see it. Five words to describe Infinity. Uh, wow. Arduous. Game changing. Emotional. Raw. Madness. Survival. Love. Inspirational. Painful. Sinister. Harrowing. Intense. 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 Intense, intense. Relentless. Family. Most definitely grateful. Gratitude. Having, having seen it now on the big screen with Brian's amazing music and everyone's amazing post-production work, uh, you know, the visual effects and the, the, the edit and, and having seen it in all its glory, you kind of go, oh, it was, that was worth it. That was worth it. That was the big, the big thing. I went, oh, we, so many people went so far, so deep, you know, on that movie over the last 12 months. 
And so to, to have it on the screen and, and have it on the big screen of the night and, and see it, it was like we all kind of went, okay, that was, that was worth it for that. There was a huge evolution in, in, in a lot of the principles of performance and a lot of the, the way we kind of wanted to shoot the film. And it looks and feels the way we wanted it to, which is a very specific uh, point of view that the film had to take. And, you know, I'm just really proud and honoured that everyone sort of came out, gave what they did to it, because I don't think anyone that worked on this film will not remember it as a moment in their life.